welcome to all of you here in our studio audience, audience and also to those watching online. My name is Stephanie Brantz. I'll be facilitating today's discussion on work health and safety and fun, exciting and safe work health and safety in major events. I would like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that we're meeting on today, the Gadigal people, and I pay my respects to their elders past and present. Today, we're going to explore some of the behind the scenes challenges of putting on a major event from music festivals to sporting events, cultural celebrations. These events are fun and exciting. We can discuss the challenges in meeting your WHS obligations while keeping it fun for the audience. Of course, it isn't possible to estimate the number of people who've attended a major event per annum, but Safe Work Australia's research has found that between 2003 and 2016, there have been 29 fatalities related to an event of some form. Erston Young, in its report published in February 2014, estimates that the output of the live performance industry is just over $2.5 billion, and the full-time workers in that industry at around 19,000. Just to clarify what we mean by a major event, and uh, this definition, of course, rolls off the tongue, WorkSafe Victoria have defined an event as a planned short-term activity undertaken in a building or structure or series of buildings or structures and or covering an area of defined open land. This includes trade shows, general shows, uh, fairs, concerts, sporting events, and public gatherings, for example demonstrations. So today we're talking to three leaders in event management to get their insights into how we deliver a fun yet safe event. And uh, these gentlemen, esteemed gentlemen, their, uh, <laughs> their qualifications are so great that I cannot do them justice in their introduction. So I do direct you to our website where you can read their full biographies. But, but for a brief introduction, firstly here on my left is Dr. Aldo Raneri, who's currently the discipline leader in occupational health and safety at Central Queensland University. Prior to commencing that role, Aldo was the director, WHS policy and legislation with the Queensland Work and Health Safety Regulator. Aldo is also the managing director and principal consultant for EventSafe which is a health and safety consultancy specialising in the live entertainment sector. So welcome to you. Dr. Rayner, good to have you here. Stephen Woolger, our gentleman in the middle here, is the health and safety manager for the 2018 Commonwealth Games. Uh, he's worked in numerous positions in health and safety roles and as manager health and safety for the Com Games. He is, of course, highly motivated and committed to ensuring that the Gold Coast 2018 event is delivered in a safe environment, ensuring a positive experience for all constituent groups. Our third panelist, Tony Williams, who is the Group Director, Regional Operations and Sector Initiatives for Safe Work New South Wales. Now, Safe Work New South Wales has Australia's largest inspector at 315 inspectors servicing nearly 300,000 workplaces across New South Wales. Prior to this role, Tony has worked in both the private and public sectors. So, gentlemen, welcome to you. Great to have you here. As I mentioned, my name is uh, Stephanie Brantz. I'm a sport and events host, so I've been the beneficiary of the hard work that gentlemen like this do uh, to stay safe at big events. And uh, I've seen the results firsthand at events like uh, FIFA World Cups, Olympic Games, Paralympic Games, New Year's Eve events, cultural celebrations, and uh, most recently at the World War I centenary commemorations, both at the Gallipoli site and across the Western Front. So my role as a broadcaster and a live MC is on the fun side. Today, <laughs> we're gonna find out what happens behind the scenes and what has to happen to make sure that everyone can have fun at major events. So gents, what we might do is start by getting a picture of how major events are put together and who's responsible for what. Although you're closest to me, so I'm going to start with you. You are first cab off the rank. Uh, the planning and design of major events it's an enormous and detailed undertaking. Can you perhaps maybe briefly outline and walk us through the main stages of planning? Yeah, thanks, Stephanie. Um, can I start by saying that uh, I've been called many things in the past, but esteemed is probably the first time. That, did you like uh, it? Yeah, I, I did indeed. <laughs> um, look, I, I think I can answer that question. There are a number of levels um, to, to that question. I think, firstly, at, at the broad strategic level, there's probably four phases to an event. Um, starting off firstly with the, the concept stage, um, and this is when you're kind of you know, um, 
dreaming up uh, what the event uh, is, is meant to achieve, um, what the outcomes are. It, it involves the whole socio-political context around events and, and all of that sort of stuff. From there, you move to the planning stage, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that um, shortly. Then I think the third stage is the implementation stage, you know, where, where you put your planning into effect and, and basically you're holding the event. Uh, and then fourthly, I think there is uh, an evaluation stage. And this is where you kind of reflect on the event um, and you take learnings from it um, for the future. Um, it's um, it's a, a stage which is often neglected, um, but I think is, is a fairly critical um, phase or stage uh, of an event. It's where you ask yourself or you look at, well, what went wrong and, and, and why did, did that go wrong? But equally as importantly, um, I think you need to ask yourself, well, what worked well? What went right? And this is in line now with uh, more, uh, more c uh, contemporary view of, uh, of the safety paradigm and what we call safety two, of moving from safety one, what went wrong, um, to safety two in terms of, well, let's have a look at what, what worked well, what went right, and, and can we apply uh, you know, what we did there to other phases of the event. Then I think you know, at an operational level, there's probably five stages of an event, which is, which is probably um, what people who are involved in events are, are more familiar with. Firstly, I think there is the, the build or construct stage. If you've got a greenfield site, you know, nothing there, a paddock, uh, or even sometimes you might have a football stadium, mm -hmm. but you need to construct stages, temporary stages, um, perhaps uh, grandstands, um, things like that. Um, so this is basically a, a construction phase, you know, pure and simple. That's then followed by uh, what's called in the, interest, in the industry a bump-in, and bump-in is where the things that are needed for the event actually arrive. So, for example, in the context of a music festival, it's where the lighting and the sound equipment arrives and, and is set up. Then you have the event itself, you have show day. And show day might actually extend to quite a number of days. Or in the case, for example, of the recent Vivid Festival in Sydney, you, you, know, you locals would, uh, would know, it lasts for a couple of weeks, I think. So, you know, there's a, an extended period of time potentially there. And then after the event, the reverse happens. There's bump out. So they take everything out. Uh, and then the final stage is the, um, what you might call the deconstruct or the takedown stage, you know, where the, the temporary infrastructure is actually uh, removed. Now, it's also, I think, fairly important to consider things like the spatial and temporal dimensions uh, of an event. In other words, when does your event start and where does it actually start? Um, and, um, you know, if, if, if you think about this strategically, the event doesn't start at the gate of the venue. Mm. The event starts way out somewhere at some undefined point. Um, and it also starts, you know, at some undefined time before show day, basically. And it's important to consider that because... Um, you know, that's critical for the logistics of, of getting people to the event um, and also dealing with, uh, with the public authorities and the stakeholders um, who have responsibilities around transport and, and public order, for example. Um, and also it's important for the provision of public information to, um, to people uh, to ensure the smoothest possible approach to the, to the venue um, and also their dispersal uh, after the event. So I might just leave it there at, at, at this stage. Sure, and Stephen, for the uh, 2018 Commonwealth Games, you would, of course, already been through a number of these steps. Specific to the Games, has uh, Aldo broadly covered the steps that you go through? And can you also tell us who's responsible, who makes it happen on time, on budget, and most importantly, safely? Yes, uh, definitely. And, and, and Aldo's right. We, we do go through the same um, processes uh, loosely around those bits. You know, our infrastructure is a little bit bigger than normal events because we're sort of one event happening 18 times. So um, it, it, it's a number of concurrent activities that need to go on. Um, we need to engage, obviously, with the state regulators, um, also the Queensland Police Service and all the other uh, emergency services that have a function within that because it's not only the impact you have on a staging event, the impact you have on the community. Um, and, you know, if you can imagine building a set of stands that would take you probably three or four weeks to build, 
that extends your event times somewhat significantly. So the minor disruption that local people might see around an event actually extends a little bit further on um, than where we are. And I, and I think people get focused on just the event. So, you know, a concert happens on a certain day, the games will happen from the 4th to the 15th of April. Um, but there's actually a big tail either side of that. And actually the pull down at the end is probably our most dangerous part in a health and safety uh, bit because there's a lot of time pressures to give stadiums back. Some of those stadiums are actively in, in season at the time. So, you know, you've got to take out everything that, that does for an athletic event and give it back to a football event. So it takes, to, takes those bits around. So you have to do all that in, 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 not in isolation of what's going on in the community around. So we can't afford not to engage. We can't afford not to be um, involving those people through that process. Sometimes it needs some decisions to be made at, at state level um, and higher to decide on funding and other things that go through that point. Uh, but also the decisions to be made about rerouting normal transport routes, you know, how you then get through roads that are closed, how you then get traffic flowing in, a, in an environment where there will be more buses than there are at the moment, more people, and Easter holidays. So it's, it's a little bit of a challenge. Now for the interesting side, Tony, who's responsible legally and what are the requirements? Yeah, so, so certainly the, uh, the organiser as the person conducting the, the business or undertaking, the undertaking generally in this case, holds the key responsibility. So they really have the responsibility to keep people safe. So whether they're workers, whether they're uh, volunteers, whether they're the patrons that are attending, whether they're contractors. So there's a huge range of uh, people they need to um, you know, have ultimate responsibility for. However, the, the world of the, the major event is, is very interesting. It's, it's huge, it's very diverse, as was as was said. So we have what are called shared concurrent responsibilities. So where other businesses or other people um, may be undertaking roles, bring that package together, and they also have, have, uh, have responsibilities and they need to live up to those responsibilities. And as has already been said, absolute, it's absolutely critical that those responsibilities are, are clear, that people know where their responsibilities start and stop, and that that organiser, as the person with the key responsibility, it's quite uncompromising in terms of making sure that those various parties deliver on what they should be doing. But look, rest assured, if, if worst case scenario, if we have an incident, um, the reality is, for a, a safety regulator, that we'll be talking to all the parties in that chain. So you can think of it as a supply chain, whatever, however you want to think of it. All of those parties that need to play their role and should have done something to prevent what has occurred, we'll be talking to them and we'll be trying to identify what they should have done and did they do it. Um, but absolutely, the organiser will have that key responsibility. Thanks, gents. Well, let's uh, move on and have a look at some selected risks and perhaps uh, practical risk control. Aldo, to come back to you, at any entertainment venue or event, all these protocols might have been adhered to. But of course, on show day, you deal with something called the public, who might not have read your safe work handbook. <laughs> now, in Australia and overseas, uh, there have been some well-documented disasters around crowd control. Can you uh, perhaps talk to those and what we've learnt, what the biggest challenges are? Yeah, sure. Um, I might just start by um, making the point that the, the 29 people um, that were advertised as fatalities relate to workers. Um, if, if you're talking about members of the public, uh, for example, who've been injured or, or certainly killed uh, at events, you're talking thousands. Um, and again, depending on what time span you, you, you look at, uh, even tens of thousands. I guess when you look at events worldwide, um, the major issues uh, tend to cluster around certain types of events. Um, and um, in developing countries, these are generally religious festivals and, and, and folk festivals. So for example, the big ticket item is the, the Haji pilgrimage in Saudi Arabia, that seems to claim several thousand uh, people um, nearly every year and, and certainly a concerted effort has gone into trying to make that, that safe. Um, and, but that's the kind of, there's a, there's a behavioural you know, element there that, uh, that is ingrained, if you like, in, uh, as part of the fabric of, of that event. In developing countries, the, the issues tend to be more around sports, sports events, um, particularly football, and, and by football I mean the round ball one, soccer. Uh, the and world game. The, real, the world game, exactly, <laughs> as, as, as our dearly departed Les Murray would say. Um, and, and rugby to some extent. Um, the game they play in heaven. 
There you go. <laughs> oh, that, oh, I didn't know. I can't wait then. <laughs> um, and certainly around music festivals, outdoor music festivals. You know, unfortunately, um, we had one fatality here. We've had one fatality here in Australia back in... Um, 1990 at a, at a music festival. But internationally, there, there are lots of examples and um, you, people might be familiar with the Hillsborough uh, incident, which was a, a football stadium. There's plenty around uh, to read on Hillsborough. And when you look at that, you can just see so many things that, that were wrong with, with what was going on there. And they all just coalesced uh, together. Um, you know, more recently um, in the uh, early 90s, the Ros Roskilde Festival in, uh, in Denmark um, claimed six young people. More recently in, uh, in Germany, in Duisburg, the Love Parade, um, which was only in probably, I think, 2013, maybe 2015, I can't quite remember, um, claimed um, the lives of 19 odd people. Uh, and again, you look at those and, um, and you see there's so many things um, wrong with, uh, with what was happening there. There are hundreds and hundreds of hazards to look at at events um, and they all need to be considered. I think the, the, big, the big four uh, for me um, are, and in increasing order of kind of importance, firstly what um, you might refer to as dodgy infrastructure. Right? So, Is that the official term? <laughs> yeah, it's a technical expression. Um, you know, this is uh, a grandstand that, uh, that might collapse um, or some temporary staging uh, might collapse. Or, as we've seen on, on a number of occasions uh, throughout Australia, an amusement device or a ride will, will fail and, as a consequence of that, uh, people get severely injured or, or, or die. And I'm sure uh, my, my colleagues here will have more to say about infrastructure, particularly the... <laughs> from a regulatory perspective. The second big one um, for me is weather. Um, and obviously, you know, if, if you're talking about a, an outdoors event, I mean, not such a big issue if it's an indoors event. But um, if you're talking about an outdoor event, then, then the weather is, uh, is uh, a fairly major consideration, uh, both in terms of inclement weather, you know, lightning strikes, hail, that sort of stuff. And, and there have been a number of examples out of the United States where people have been killed um, from lightning strikes and um, uh, lightning strikes actually affecting infrastructure. And more particularly, though, on a, on a, on a nice, warm uh, summer's day, uh, there's the issue of hydration and, and dehydration that needs to be considered. Um, you know, from, a, from a, uh, an event organiser's point of view, you say, well, what can I do about that? Um, you know, I can't control the weather. Uh, absolutely true, you can't control the weather, but you can make provisions uh, to minimise or lessen the effect that the weather has on, on participants. So in other words, you might have uh, water stations throughout, uh, throughout your venue. Uh, that people can access and, you know, not charge them $8 a bottle for water, but, you know, really make it accessible uh, to them. The third thing, um, and regrettably these days, is the, the potential uh, for a terrorist um, incident. <coughs> and, um, you know, we've seen that sort of fairly recently in, in Paris. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's another risk. I, I don't want to make too much of it. Um, the, the, the terrorist issue is, uh, is well dealt with by the authorities and I think in that regard um, event organisers, uh, venue owners and operators really need to tic-tac very closely with, with the authorities and, um, and to take on board any recommendations that, uh, that they have. The fourth one, which to me and for me is, is the highest priority and the biggest risk of all, uh, and it is unfortunately the least understood and therefore the least managed uh, aspect of an, of an event is the crowd itself mm? and the dangers that are inherent in having a large number of people um, together. Um, I, I can talk more about the, the, the crowd issues I think uh, a little bit later. Uh, give my colleagues a chance to say something. <laughs> um, but you know in terms of when you look at events worldwide um, you know, the, the underlying fundamental cause is either poor planning or an absolute lack of planning. Hmm? So the, the whole issue of planning is critical uh, for events. And in the context particularly of uh, crowd management, um, there has been um, a fundamental uh, lack of understanding and, and indeed information about um, 
the dynamics, if you like, uh, of crowd behaviour, or what we're now starting to call crowd science. So there is now an emerging discipline called crowd science, mm. which looks at the aspects of, of how to deal with crowd management. Yeah, we might talk to that in yep. uh, just a moment, but uh, Stephen, it is a blight on modern society, and Aldo did touch on it, uh, the terrorism aspect, forward planning for the Commonwealth Games. How much of your energy needs to go into that, or is it just on the list? Look, I, I think it's one of those things that's on the list. Um, you know, it is, it, it's a shame that the, that's the environment we now um, mm. sit in, but, you know, the, the hazards associated with people driving cars down the streets has always has existed. It's just they're now being weaponised in the way they're used. So I think it needs to be considered, but it's one of those, those considerations that needs, needs to be put in place. We work closely with the um, people responsible for that, so again the police service and, and they do assessments around our venues with that. Um, but again it will be one of those things that we mitigate as part of the overall thing. We have a little bit of a clue about what's going on. The, the, the Australian um, intelligence services are very good at what they do, uh, which has been proved recently. Um, so I think, you know, it's a concern, but it's not an over-concern. Mm. And, and, you know, I think one of the things we are certainly keen about is that people shouldn't change their behaviours just because there are some lunatics out there. So, you know, we'd encourage people to go to events and make sure you can do what they want. People are doing the right thing to make sure that happens. Um, and just to go back on Aldo's thing about weather, you know, what better way to mitigate than hold it in Queensland? So... <laughs> <laughs> I have to admit, from a, a broadcast <coughs> perspective, Aldo, you just uh, briefly just reminded me of our recent event at Anzac Day at Villa Botine in France for the Western Front commemorations, and the temperature dropped at about four o'clock in the morning, it dropped to the very, very low single figures. So as part of the WHS uh, protocol, they started handing out space blankets. That looked so horrible on television with all these reflective blankets that it was an absolute nightmare for the broadcasters, but everyone was warm. So that's what mattered, that's wasn't good. it? <laughs> uh, before we come back to your mitigating risk, uh, Stephen, Tony, I'd just like to uh, give you perhaps the final word on, on the terrorist aspect. Uh, how do you legislate or regulate or in anything for something you don't know if it's going to happen? Yeah, look, I certainly agree with Stephen. Look, I, I think it's just in the mix in terms of risks, you know, and, and the last thing we'd want an organiser to do is to concentrate too much on, on one risk and, you know, at the... You know, and letting others um, sneak up, if you like, and be the one that really causes the issues at the event. Um, you know, the reality is a major stand collapse or, a, or whatever the case may be could cause just as much damage and, and, and heartache as a terrorist issue. So, so let's um, have a well-rounded approach to, uh, to our risk management strategy and make sure we cover off all of those risks. And the reality is for us that if, if, you're, a, if you're in the, the uh, major event business, if you're in that business, um, regulators have very high expectations of you. You know, you're running events here that, that if you get it wrong, um, you can put a lot of the community in harm's way. We're unapologetic in saying, um, as safety regulators, that we have you on a very, very high shelf and we expect a lot of you. And as has been said a couple of times already, we expect um, you know, that organisers really do their homework in terms of planning the event right up front. And as Stephen says, that starts a long way out um, to make sure that all of those risks, whatever they might be, are covered off. Stephen, Tony mentioned those uh, ill-fated words, collapsing stand. Mm. Uh, let's talk about infrastructure. <laughs> and uh, Aldo mentioned uh, crowd control. Can you tell us uh, what you do in planning an event to mitigate those risks? How important is the infrastructure and what are the main practical construction safety issues? Definitely. Um, you know, for us, there isn't enough infrastructure in Australia to put on a Commonwealth Games. So we're bringing some stuff from overseas, um, you know, in, in the... Uh, Olympic space in the Commonwealth Games space, a lot of that infrastructure moves from games to games. And with that comes some which, overseas... Which part of the infrastructure are you talking so, about? So here? particularly about temporary stands, mm -hmm. um, temporary seating, some of those um, bits associated with tentage and other temporary buildings that go into those. So In Australia, we don't have enough tentage. Not for the amount That's of what we're putting together. <laughs> not the sort of tents that we need to put mm -hmm. that on. So you can't just get the run-of-the-mill 
it's got to meet a certain requirement. And, you know, we need to make sure that that's the safe requirement that, that puts in there. So we, we're sourcing a lot of those from different places. Um, now, there might be um, businesses locally that can help with that, and we're, we're certainly going through the local market first, but some of the stuff does come from overseas. So associated with that then is overseas contractors, and contractor management in our space is enormous. You can't underestimate the fact that, you know, we can't put that on uh, games on without those sort of people there. So for us to get that right, the engagement with the contractors and the requirement for those to get their conditions and tell us how they're going to do safely up front is really important. We've applied a real um, measure to those and we apply the same measure regardless of the nature and type of, of equipment they're going to provide. So um, the same requirement applies to the person building um, 16,000 temporary seats as it does to the person providing a tent or the person doing catering. So, you know, we want them all to be safe in the way they do stuff. We are not going to tell them how to do their business, though, because I certainly don't understand how to build a huge stand, um, and I trust the people that will do that. And we have a certifier that certifies the stand basically in the design phase, but also in the completion phase as well. So you have to bring all those together. If you consider the tail, um, it's like a huge tail up front and a little tail at the end, but it's a huge tail about getting all those providers, all those commodities in place and getting the safe people that can put through. Now, saying that, there are some niches in that as well. Um, there are only certain companies in the world that provide certain sports equipment and sports facilities, so you are reliant on the overseas market for that. Um, and we're aware of those that, that come with a few challenges around that space. And, you know, it's back to the legislative environment we sit in. You know, they don't do construction white cards in Germany. So, you know, you need to be aware of the fact that those people need to be able to work in our environment as well. So, you know, we, we put a lot of effort in up front to make sure that that comes to, comes to fruition. And the planning stage is about how you build and how you get people in and out of those stands and the emergency uh, requirements associated with that are all considered at that planning stage. Well, despite the guidelines, the preparations and the safety measures, Tony, incidents still occur. So what concerns regulators the most out of all those issues? And what are the expectations around, say, plant safety, construction and amusement devices? Clearly any of these, these major events have a, a, a very significant <coughs> range of risks that need to be being managed across a range of areas. Um, I guess that I'd start off by saying the biggest concern that regulators would probably have, and without going into the specific issues, which I will in a minute, is an organiser not doing um, you know, enough in terms of their, their planning work. So, so that is a risk for you know, the organiser, it's a risk for those that are attending, but in terms of, of a regulator, um, we really expect to see, and as I said before, we hold these people that are pretty high level, um, we expect to see very good planning process in place. But if we break that down into what some of the, 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 the individual risks are, so certainly every time you introduce uh, plant of any description onto a site, um, as Stephen Enaldo has indicated, that they bring inherent risks. You need to, you know, um, two little words that we hear splashed around very regularly, and Stephen was touching on a, a due diligence. So we expect the organiser to really do their, their, their backgrounding in terms of you, if you want to bring a piece of plant on and through a particular supplier or, or business, you want to make sure you, you do your homework there and, and check the bona fides of, of, of them. If you've got people assembling things on site and they are, you know, need to hold a high-risk high work licence, for example, you need to make sure they, they actually do. And not just ask that question, but make sure you follow that up and be quite, I said before, uncompromising in making sure that you go through that, that process in, in quite a, a structured clinical way to make sure you cover off all of those risks. But then we have others, you know, electrical. You know, you look at any of these major events and the amount of electrics around these, uh, these events can be quite staggering. And it's very important that um, you work with businesses that are supplying all of those, those, um, you know, those, those mechanics and those electrical um, goods to make sure that they are um, sound, they read, meet appropriate standards, they've been maintained, and they have records of, of that maintenance. And then we get into, I guess, you know, what we're seeing more and more often at at all sorts of events, and that's amusement devices. And that starts to introduce a real world of its own in terms of obligations for organisers. Um, there, there are certainly obligations for um, those supplying those amusement devices, but in terms of that overall event organisation and that organiser, they really need to make sure that if they're going to introduce um, amusement devices into that mix of issues and that, that the mix of the event, that they, um, they work through um, what is required. 
So that would start by making sure that in terms of the amusement the device you're going to have on site, it's the right one. It suits the profile of the event, it suits the profile of the audience, um, and it can be managed safely in the space that's, that's available um, uh, without putting people, um, both workers or users, users at risk. And a lot of this is, a, is for an organiser is about asking the right questions of the right people. So talking to the business and asking for things like, is the, is the, the device registered? You know, it needs to be registered and, and be registered at the time of the event. Has the appropriate maintenance been done? Are the workers that are operating this, have they been trained? Are they competent in doing that? And we don't want to just see a, a head nodded. We actually want to see evidence of that. Um, um, do they, they know what happens in terms of an emergency? You know, and some of these, you know, devices can take people to great heights. You know, do they, do they have the evacuation issues sorted and, and all of those, uh, those sorts of issues? So there are a huge, huge range of issues that revolve around that particular issue that, that need to be managed. And, uh, you know, and I'm not saying in any way that organisers should be taking on the obligations of, of others, but they need to have a good due diligence of process to make sure that they're asking the right questions and that they're making sure that those that carry the risks and have their, those obligations are actually del delivering on what they should be delivering on. We can see how the very public manner in which the events in, in Queensland around uh, amusement devices yeah. panned out, what happens when it goes so horribly wrong. Before we leave the, uh, the, the risks and, and concerns for regulators, can you tell me where electricity falls on that list? Yeah, very high, <laughs> very high. So, um, um, and you know, I, I mentioned amusement devices, devices before, so part of that is making sure that they can provide you with a register of the electrical equipment and the fact that that has been maintained. Um, um, and once again, you don't accept the fact that somebody's got it somewhere. You need to actually have a look at it and make sure it's up to date. But controlling those risks, you need to make sure you've got qualified people. You know, you don't want people um, that are unqualified setting up electrics in environments where you've got large numbers of people, um, ensuring that people haven't got access to those. So, you know, crowd control has been touched on by both Aldo and Steve and a number of times. And you've got to make sure people can't get into places where that equipment is stored or wh where that equipment is live. So sometimes it's not uh, the, um, the, the direct you know, use of that, that, that device, but it's actually keeping people away from where they could put themselves, um, often unknowingly, at risk around those devices. Yeah. Stephen, Tony mentioned having the right people and making sure that the right people are doing the right jobs. I imagine for the Commonwealth Games, these roles were, the delineation was, uh, was already decided quite a long time ago. Can you tell us how you approach that, how you approach the division of roles and responsibilities to deliver the best, most fun and safest event? Mm. Yeah, and, and I think it goes back to where the accountability and responsibility for safety sits, and I think Tony's alluded to that a little bit. Goldock, uh, the Commonwealth Games Corporation, remains accountable for safety through our whole experience. Now, we engage certain people to do roles for us that we rely on their skills and capability and, and um, particular niche that they do, and we, we make them responsible for their own safety. So it's making um, how, how you find out that those consistencies can be applied across the organisation, make sure that you work through the fact that you know, there might be different contractors working simultaneously doing really high-risk stuff it's how you coordinate and cooperate those those activities going on within those venues. Um, you know, so we um, will appoint, in our case, what we call an overlay delivery partner, which will become our principal contractors through the um, actual build phase of the games that bring all that together. So we select um, organisations usually that have experience in doing this previously, uh, but can operate over multiple environments with multiple contractors that again are operating over multiple areas trying to reduce some of the confusion associated with that as well. So we try to keep the message simple within the organising committee to make sure that people understand that safety is their responsibility, but it can be done quite simply. And, you know, safety people are the worst at confusing people about how to do things safely sometimes. Um, so it's actually bringing it back to the basics of, you know, we need to do this safely, we need to deliver it well, but we need to make people also responsible. We maintain the accountability, sh check what they're doing, uh, but engage with the right people to make sure those, those things are happening. And it's getting an environment that actually helps people be safe while they're at work. I think one of the things that, that I struggle with a little bit, and I know this is a bit off track a little bit, but is this word around safety culture. It's actually business culture, and, and within the games industry, we have a really good culture. So people want to come and deliver an event, um, they want. They know it's going to happen on a certain date. They want it to be fantastic. They want to be lots of bravado. People win medals. Everybody's happy at the end of it. 
But if you can embrace that culture that sits within an organization, actually safety is quite in easy to put into that. And it's, it's engaging people to be safe in their working environment, regardless of what that is. And I imagine for something like the Commonwealth Games that the regulators are, are quite interested in, in everything you're doing. How is that relationship? <laughs> it's interesting, really. I mean, they're very interested. Uh, we, we have events, obviously, on the coast all the time. Uh, sometimes you don't ever see an inspector because it's all safe and good to go. But we've got them lining up, you know, even ones you've probably never heard of before that do a regulatory <laughs> function that nobody's ever met. And now they because he knows what I mean. Um, so, yeah, we have a really good relationship with them. For us, uh, again, as an organisation, committee we aim to engage early we want them to work with us because there will be things that the regulators won't have ever seen before and they certainly wouldn't have seen this scale of event um, mm. on the coast and I think educating the regulator a little bit about those things and allowing them to have the, the purpose not only to be a regulatory function but to learn from the experience of an overseas contractor that might do something slightly different but still does it safely the contractors locally have an opportunity to learn as well but you know Encouraging the, the regulator actually to have a different view about how you approach your regulatory function. You know, there's a learning environment. We're a very dynamic and, and fast moving environment. Um, you know, there is also the occasion that actually we're different to construction and we're different to the normal activities that go on because, you know, we might not stop. The broadcast happens, and you'll understand this yourself. You know, the, the cameras are on, the cameras are rolling, they will continue to roll regardless of what happens. And there is a customer base that is far greater out there than there is actually locally. So in some cases, we have to not bend the rules, but work within the rules safely to make sure we can still deliver what the outcomes are related to that. So uh, I think it's very interesting uh, moment with the regulator at the moment, but I think they're also keen to see a, a success as well. And that's the good thing is good events actually have an effect for everyone. And if, and if you can run an event like the Commonwealth Games safely, then you can run your music festival or your fair or whatever else you do safely as well. There's no excuse why you can't. And of course, for all the behind the scenes uh, work, all the public sees when they rock up, rock up on the day is uh, around how the crowd moves and, and crowd and, and basically traffic control. So Aldo, you touched on it briefly before and you've all three mentioned how important the planning of the site is and, and the work site plans, the work plans ahead of the event. But can you talk us through where that comes into crowd control. Aldo has a, a PhD in crowd control. I'm unclear as to whether that means you can control a crowd or whether you can tell us what the crowd will do no. in a certain situation. No. But can you talk us around sure. uh, the importance of that planning? Yeah. Look, um, you know, I think, you know, from what we've been saying, it's it, it, it probably self-evident that, that planning is fairly critical. Um, I, I did mention before that the issue of the crowd itself is is probably the least understood aspect of, of an event and uh, as a consequence it's, uh, it's, it's not dealt with generally very well uh, or at all. Uh, however, uh, you know, in the light of kind of crowd disasters that have, that have been uh, occurring and, and accumulating uh, and the evidence accumulating uh, over a number of years, I did mention that there is an emerging kind of discipline now that's referred to as crowd science. So look, I think when you're talking about um, uh, crowds and, and masses of people or mass gatherings. There are three critical elements right, to consider. The first is density. Right? How many people are packed into a space? Right? And um, that's relatively easy, I would have thought, to, to calculate because if you've, uh, if you've got a particular space, you know the dimensions or you can certainly very easily uh, configure or, or find the dimensions. And you can work out relatively easily how many people can sit comfortably, uh, not sit literally, but you know, fit um, into that space. Um, the, the research says that at about a crowd density of approximately seven to eight people per square metre, um, it starts to get uncomfortable. And that's a static crowd. Um, if, if it's a moving crowd, then that is particularly problematic. Um, I don't know if you've ever tried bunching together. In some of my classes and presentations, I do a little, a little demonstration where I get seven, eight, ten people together and um, I've got a piece of rope that's one square metre and I, I fit them in there and they go, ooh, this is, you know, this is snug. Um, and then I go, yeah, good. Um, 
walk up and down and, and they find that particularly difficult. And then you fit more and more people in and, and you know, and the people in the middle really start to, to get claustrophobic. Um, and look, there's, you know, the research is suggesting that at, at critical densities of about seven or eight people, um, and, and again, depending on the event, um, the cr people within a crowd lose their ability to move freely. So you become part of this greater amorphous fluid mass. Right? And so, and that has really serious repercussions. If you, if, um, if you, if you look at physics, for example, then that creates wave motions. Right? And so literally you can have wave motions in, in densely packed crowds. That can have some really serious effects um, obviously at the centre of, uh, of that mass of people, but also at the margins, at the edges, if you're pushed up against a barrier, for example, or a fence. Um, so density is, uh, is a, a very important consideration. A pretty easy one to kind of work with, I, I would have thought. The second critical issue, I think, is dynamics, movement. Huh? And so it's important that, for example, if you have a mass of people, that you get them moving all in the same direction, so that there are no cross flows uh, or back flows, for example. One of the real problems, for example, with the Love Parade incident um, was that, um, well, there were a number of problems, but um, the, the organisers seriously underestimated the number of people that were going to turn up. And they had a venue, and it was a greenfield site, never used before, but this venue had one entrance and the same area was used as an exit. So you had cross flows of people and you had concentrate, you know, people concentrating uh, in a particular area uh, that was confined. At venues, you may find that there's a build-up of people depending on your, your processing capacity. Right? So you know, your processing capacity, you know, dealing with people, issuing them with tickets or you know, bag searching, scanning, whatever it is that, that you, you know, are going to do at the event, obviously takes time. So as people arrive, then if you're not processing people quickly enough, then there's going to, they're going to back up. You're going to have a queuing effect. And of course, people at the back, are, you know, particularly if they're all excited about getting into the event, are going to push, push, push. Uh, and so, you know, you have uh, huge potential for disaster. So, you know, try and get people moving in the same direction. Um, you know, no cross flows, no, no back flows. Again, you know, you've got to look at the design of your, of your facility. Some places you're stuck with, you know, you're stuck with a bad design. Uh, I know from experience, or one venue that, um, that I had to deal with, it was just such a poor design, but you were stuck with it. You know, there was nothing you could do. Um, and so you had to work around it in terms of creating alternate paths for people. The third dimension is that of behaviour. And, uh, you know, of the three, again, this is probably the, the uh, least understood, the most neglected and, and to a degree the, the, the least un, uh, or the most under-researched. The behaviour of people is, uh, is very much dictated by the nature of the event um, and you need to consider um, how people are going to potentially behave uh, at your event, um, both under normal circumstances and also in emergency circumstances. Now, the emergencies, there's, there's a lot of literature around, and it's a, thankfully an area that's been sort of fairly well researched. But the movement or the behaviour of people, particularly when they're moving, um, in, under normal circumstances is not so well researched. Crowd science says you've got to consider those three aspects, and you need to consider them in terms of three critical um, spots or elements or places, I guess, uh, in terms of a venue. Ingress, you know, or entry point is, is critical because um, that involves your processing of people uh, and your queuing. So ingress is, can be a particularly problematic um, uh, place. Circulation, people moving around the event, you know, if people have got to go to the bathroom, um, what's the path to the bathroom? Um, and you don't want people uh, walking in the opposite direction, for example, uh, impeding them, uh, or any cross flow, or if they're going to uh, to get refreshments, whatever. Well, circulation important, and circulation is also particularly important where you have multiple uh, sites within a within a venue or multiple happenings. 
Uh, and Stephen's, I think you said you've got about 18 or so mm -hmm. of these, so good luck <laughs> with that. The same one, thank yeah, you. good luck with that. Um, and then, of course, the, the, the other aspect is the egress, you know, because people want to leave, they're happy, you know, they've had a great experience, but they want to get home, huh? or they want to get to the bus, or they want to get to the cab, so um, that's a bit, uh, bit problematic as well. Broadly, issues that, that you also need to keep in mind are, are the design uh, of, the, of the event and the design of the venue uh, or the facility. Information. Information is really critical, um, both pre-event, um, letting people know what the transport facilities are, where the entrances are, for example, how they can get in, and also um, information during the event itself. Let people know what's happening. Um, you know, through public address systems and what have you, particularly if there's an issue somewhere, you know, if there's a bottleneck uh, happening somewhere and, you know, people at the back uh, are not going to see or know what's going on. So, you know, it's critical to give them information. And then there's general management. Planning is critical around, around those, those issues, um, but in addition to the, the, the planning or the proactive uh, aspect, it's also fairly important to monitor those issues. You need to monitor the density, you need to monitor the dynamics, and you need to monitor the behaviour in real time. Right? And so you need observation, um, or there is technology now that, that assists with, with that monitoring. And so crowd science postulates um, you know, techniques like a, a ramp analysis, for example. Look at the routes, uh, look at the areas, um, what does M stand for? Look at the movement of people uh, and look at the, their profile as well. Right? And you can do sort of fairly simple stuff like, um, you know, heat mapping based on, um, you know, your knowledge of the design of areas and the expected number of people. And of course, if you've had previous events, um, you know, some events are annual, for example, if you've had previous events and you've got experience, you, you've got that to draw on as a basis or an evidence base. Um, so. Planning, critical, but the monitoring aspect is also very important as well and, and, and shouldn't be neglected. Interesting. When I listen to what you say, I, as a frequent traveller, it baffles me that loading 200 odd people onto an airplane and deplaning them afterwards always seems to be so problematic in terms of crowd science. There's always one person, the board's from the wrong end, so I can't <laughs> even imagine what your planning process, uh, Stephen, is for the <laughs> arrival of all these visitors for the Commonwealth Games. We are going to uh, open our forum to the floor in just a moment, but just to wrap up, uh, Stephen, everything Aldo mentioned really talks to good communication. How do you ensure good communication and a really good site culture? You know, it extends across our partners as well, and that's the working with the local community, the councils locally, the police as well is really important. So it's about having open communication among that. So we'll have several um, situations where that will be put in place. There'll be a network within the venues themselves because we don't look just at the venue. We also look along those arrival and, and routes, what we call the last mile. It's not a physical mile, but that point between gate and transport hub. So, you know, there's a lot of people that move through there. And we want to reduce the impost on the transport hub because if we release 3,000 people to the local station, we will soon flood that sort of environment. So if we can get communication right, we can hold people within the venue. We can have pop-up um, uh, events or entertainers that will actually keep people and, and then enable that crowd to move a lot easier. Um, and on the way in, crowds are really well self-regulated. The problem we're gonna have is that security check, but you know, then don't bring the stuff that's on the restricted items list and you will get through. You know, don't take your scissors through the airport and you'll be okay. So, you know, it's, it's being able to get those people through quickly into the environment they wanna be in. You know, in a Commonwealth Games, you've probably got a more compliant crowd, except for certain sports that like to amp up. The fact that they want to get people excited about what they do, and then we'll deal with the outcomes of that afterwards. And, you know, if the Australians win a gold medal, everybody's going to want a high, and you've got to then get that crowd managed back somehow into the station without them um, leaping up and down too much. But so, they're happy. But so they're happy. <laughs> it's all good. Um, so, so you're able to work with that as well. But it's been able to encourage them to get to the right points and have places where you can actually send people to to get them out. So it's all of those agencies need to talk to each other. Obviously, the police is ultimately responsible for crown and public safety outside the venue, so they will step into that point. But, you know, for us, it's about managing those people across all those domains to get them out there. And, you know, good planning will come to assist with that, and I'm sure we'll be in a position where the planning is, is well. The fact is, is the implementation at the time. And again, you know, given the current 
uh, environment with so much technology, you know, will we have eyes and ears everywhere to know what's going on in those spaces to monitor them? Yeah, planning's so very important and you hope that the good planning and the forward planning means a safe and happy event. Tony, to close though, tell us, in the event of an emergency, those things that you uh, plan for but uh, you hope don't happen, how important is that planning around the responsibilities of the contractors, uh, the volunteers and public safety during oh, those look, events? It's absolutely critical and, and I guess that's where regulators turn a lot of their attention to making sure that emergency planning is thorough, that it's enrolled the right people. So clearly, you know, people that aren't here today, they know the police and emergency service have, services have a critical role there in terms of that forward planning process. But we need to be sure that, um, that when things go wrong, people have been uh, um, made very, very clear what their role is. They've been given the appropriate training. And, and we'd like to think that that's been pressure tested in some way, that we've had practices, we've had trials, and, and often it's only after we have a, an, an event, you know, a, an emergency at an event, um, and the response goes beautifully, that when we talk to people, we find out, well, in actual fact, people were clear about their roles, people had been trained, and people knew what to do. So very often you'll have that many people at these events from different places doing different things, security, you know, could be musos, could be all sorts of people, um, that people need to know what to do. And, um, and that upfront front planning, and I know we've said that a hundred times, but it's so, so critical, um, is very, very important to making sure when something does go wrong, and you know, that scenario planning and testing is, is oh so critical, um, it really, you know, it really shows um, when something does go wrong, how that response works. Well, gents, thank you very much indeed. And now it seems a good opportunity to open the floor to our audience to ask any questions they may have. Can I ask you to please raise your hand if you have a question and wait until the microphone reaches you and then please identify yourself by name and workplace and perhaps even just briefly stand so that our panellists can see where you are in the room. Good morning and thank you for a fantastic presentation. Um, my name is Roderick van Gelder. I run a company called Stage Safety. And I have a question for Tony. As a risk manager for events, I often find that events managed by smaller councils are the worst offenders. What is the regulator doing in terms of communicating with smaller councils about the proper processes? So, so look, you, you raise an excellent point there. So clearly, you know, um, um, the people running events, it's quite disparate, quite a disparate group. We have professional organisations that run it. We sometimes have community, um, you know, groups, but we also have people like local government. So I can tell you, and, I, and look, I can generally only speak for what in New South Wales, but if there is an event occurring in a particular uh, local government area that is going to be a significant event, attract a lot of people, um, um, what, normally these days we are approached by councils a um, long way ahead of time to help in that planning. And if we don't, we, we will be approaching them anyway to make sure they have that, that, that appropriate... Um, um, you know, insight and the, and the skills and capabilities. Regulators are always happy to provide advice and assistance, and we do that free of charge. Um, we're happy to, I know in, we've just had splendour in the grass in New South Wales, um, and we had a, a number of inspectors allocated to specifically work with those organisers, which included, you know, as part of the, the event um, management, if you like, the local government up there, the local council. So we work very, very closely with them. We allocate resources to that, because, it's very, very important that um, you know regu regulators aren't seen to be um, you know getting in the way of, of business, if you like. We want these events to be successful, but we just want the outcomes to be good, good outcomes and, and safe. Um, so we're always very, very happy to um, provide advice. We're only a phone call away, and we'll we'll help people develop their plans, um, guide them in terms of what their due diligence obligations are, guide them in terms of what good planning looks like. So look, um, I strongly encourage. Um, um, anybody that's in that business to just talk to the regulator and talk to them early. Yep. Uh, good morning, thank you for that. Uh, Grant Whitehorn, Scouts New South Wales. Uh, I just wanted to know, considering uh, the basis of a lot of the things that you gentlemen had to say was all about culture and the prevalence of having a good safety culture to get a good safe outcome, um, what are your attitudes or opinions with regards to should safety or the head of safety for an event be sitting at the event management or executive table? And if not, why doesn't that happen? So to me, I, I, as I said before, I, I have a little issue with safety culture. It's about business culture and it's how you do things safely within that confines. 
Um, so I, as the manager of health and safety for the Gold Coast Commonwealth Games, report directly to the deputy CEO. He's brought that around because of his previous games experience. So he's done several games previously, understands the importance of safety within those. Uh, and, you know, encouraging a, an executive to take that important step within um, that area is something that they do themselves. You know, they don't actually need me to tell them to be safe. They do that because it's within their business culture. And they understand that not only are they going to be delivering the event and making it safe for the workforce and the, and the numbers of volunteers and other people that will come to that, but also the spectators that come as well. And they completely understand that's critical to the, the, the success of that outcome. Can't talk for smaller events, but certainly within our major event, that's the way it sits within that environment, certainly here and certainly uh, in the UK events. Again, you can't talk for that across all uh, of events around the world, and some others probably don't have those bits. Um, but I think for us to be encouraged within the fact that actually people take safety importantly as part of their business um, is, is actually makes my job a lot easier to do that. So although I don't sit within the executive board, I know that they are talking about safety. I know that our board talks about safety. Um, so to them, it's important in their normal business. I might just say that, um, unfortunately, many organisations, probably less mature organisations, um, see safety as some sort of bolt-on, add-on, and they see it as a nuisance. Um, and it's unfortunate because they don't understand the benefits that, that adopting a safe approach will have in terms of productivity and, and you, know, um, you know, relationship building, um, et cetera. Um, it is unfortunate. There are organisations, and, and, and it's good to hear that, uh, that the Commonwealth uh, Games is, uh, is uh, uh, you know, amongst them, where people at the highest levels um, really understand the importance of safety. And I guess it's uh, because of the, 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 the focus or the, the higher focus on, on the safety of large numbers of members of the public that's kind of a, an imperative, if you like, for organisations like that. Um, but look, it is unfortunate, and um, it's just an education process. Um, unfortunately, when people go and do business degrees, you look at the business degrees across Australia, how many of them have safety, health and safety in them, as a critical element of doing business in the same way as accounting is, or logistics, or you know, personnel management? Very, very few. And, and, and for me, as an for me as an academic, you know that's that's problematic, and particularly in the safety game, that's problematic because until people or the community or whoever sees safety as an integral component of doing business, it'll be seen as just something that has to be done, almost a compliance tick and flick nuisance exercise, which it shouldn't be, um, and, and doesn't have to be. Anything to add? Only that, look, we see leadership from the top, if you like, as being a key key element of, of um, you know, what a safety landscape looks like in any business, you know, and that's very, very important that we, we see that. Where we see that, 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 that good, strong leadership from the top, we'll see that across all the areas of the business. And I, I tend to agree with Stephen in terms of it's a lot more, a lot broader. It's, it's, about, it's about the business culture. And, you know, if we've got a strong leadership, they'll be doing their finances well, they'll be doing their safety well, they'll be doing everything well, and it won't be the bolt-on, It'll be integrated, and, it, and it'll just just how we do do business around here, and that's what we love to see, and that's what we always encourage and happy always to provide advice. Perhaps one more final question. My name's Kerry Sebio. I'm from Canterbury Banks Town Council, so certainly not a small council. In fact, we are the largest. We are the new city of Canterbury Council, and on what you were just saying, Tony, about leadership from the top. That's exactly what we've got. Our general manager at every meeting. What is paramount in our culture is safety. So that's always the number one concern, it's the number one issue, it's what we're told that we need to incorporate into all of our business plans, not just for events, I'm obviously in the events unit, but you know, throughout council. And it's not just for the safety of our, uh, our workers and the safety of our residents and patrons that come to our events, it's the safety of our reputation. And I realise we're talking about um, safety at events here today, so we're not touching on that, but that's something that is paramount, and that's leading to my question now. And my problem is actually with the hire companies, because there are so many of them around that the dodgy infrastructure is still there. It's still there out back in the yards. 
and they are still bringing it out to us time and time again if we don't use reputable firms. So my question is regarding tender processes because I always look at it and I look at the weightings. If we're looking at a weighting of you know, quality, performance, delivery against price, price for me does not hold a weighting of 40% because I'm looking at other areas. So when you're looking at the suppliers that you're using for these huge events, how do you use the weightings? Is that so, and how would you suggest that local councils revisit that? Yeah, look, I, I can talk to it because I had this um, conversation with our procurement people up front when I arrived. Um, health and safety for us is a mandatory criteria. You pass or you fail. That tends to cause some issues around local councils. I understand that, having been from that environment, about encouraged local business to do things because some of those local businesses won't pass um, up front in some of the criteria that's applied to that. Um, so we apply that across the organisation. Now, we do go back to them to ask for clarification about certain things they put in place. However, it's unfair within the tender process if you assist somebody to get over the line to start with, and we don't do that. However, we do accept some risk associated with that to a point to know, you know, if you've got someone, you can understand their gaps, their capabilities that need help with, and we can help with you once you've signed against the line. So it's about understanding the, the application or what you want to see from them initially. Uh, and, you know, although we have a question about third party certification, I don't care. You know, I want you to tell me how you're going to be safe. And actually, the people that even do third party certification, I still want you to tell me how you're going to be safe. Because there are so many companies that put that, that little box, tick that box and think they're all sweet, but actually fail to implement that on the ground. So it's about how you encourage, how you get the information back that you want to see, asking a fair level set of questions that actually say, this is what we want to see, this is how you implement it when you've done it previously before and what the outcomes of that have been. And even if you've got it wrong, what have you done then to fix that so you're safe the next time you come? And then if you get them across the line of that initial tender process, and we're pretty hard-nosed about the fact, as I say, it's a pass and a fail as far as I'm concerned, um, but once you know there is a level of risk with them, you can work with them when they arrive to understand that. And I, you know, I, I particularly uh, give that to not only the overseas contractors that we live we work with, but some of our local ones as well, that you know, although they have the right ticks in boxes and the right level of information that they will give to you, they've never implemented it on the scale we're asking them to do that. We want them to be safe when they get there. So you know you're going to work with them to make sure that happens. Stephen, thank you very much indeed. Uh, gents, can I ask all three of you as we uh, wrap up to give perhaps one overarching takeaway that you'd like our audience both here and online to have from today? Well, look, I think the Australian community should have a lot of confidence in the fact that when they go to a major event in Australia, it's going to be safe. You know, I, yes, we have had some incidents around the various uh, jurisdictions, but generally speaking, consider, considering the number of events we have, the, the range of events we have, and the huge numbers of patrons, it is a safe place to be, and we should never lose sight of that. There are a lot of people working behind the scenes, not only safety regulators, but police, you know, organisers, emergency services, to make sure that happens. We want them to be successful. It's part of our community fabric. And uh, look, generally speaking, I think we do a great job and we're getting better every time. Steve? Yeah, I, th I think for me, don't lose sight of what the event is there for. You know, we can get tied up in doing a lot of stuff to keep people safe and to, you know, to make sure we're ticking the right boxes. But actually, there is somebody that's buying a ticket that's coming to an event that actually wants to get the enjoyment out of that. So don't lose sight of the fact that actually those members of the public who you can't control in how they move are actually there to enjoy what they're doing. So sometimes it's important to remember that there is that element to it as well and we get focused on how we put it together. But, you know, it's not difficult. It's a very exciting place to be. But, you know, it just needs a bit of due diligence applied to it to make sure it's safe. Just before we go to uh, Aldo, Stephen, with the Gold Coast Commonwealth Games, where are your allegiances going to lie? Um, well, tickets are available. <laughs> <laughs> Moving right along. Hello. <laughs> oh, I think, um, you know, the takeaway for me is, uh, look, plan rigorously, monitor comprehensively uh, and evaluate. Uh, always evaluate at the end and, and, and see what you can learn uh, and take those learnings into the next event. Um, hmm. Indeed. Well, thank you. 
to our panellists, Dr Aldo Ranieri, Stephen Woolga and Tony Williams. It's been wonderful to have you here this morning. Thank you to our studio audience here and of course to all of you watching online as well. We hope you found this informative and thought provoking and we look forward to welcoming you all back to another virtual seminar series with Safe Work Australia. Good morning. Thank you.